It was invented before the word invention existed. The design comes from the spirit world and it comes from a long, long time ago. My elders tell me like 30,000 years ago we started building these. Very ancient, we're looking in the, you know, uh, thousands of years old technology. No one knows the name of the inventor. It was a community invention, if you will. It just, it's the, the name, if there even is a single name, is lost to us in prehistory. But North American civilization developed because of it. So there were these vast trade networks that were thriving pre-colonization, and they were thriving because of the canoe. The canoe and Canada are completely linked together. Without the canoe, Canada wouldn't be here, or it wouldn't be here in the form that we see it. A lot of the map that we would recognize as Canada, the canoe played an active role. It was because of the canoe. You would have a very different looking Canada. You would have a very different looking fur trade. My name is Kevin Brownlee. I'm the curator of archaeology at the Manitoba Museum. My role here is caretaker of the collections, the archaeology collections from Manitoba and abroad. Traveling Canada by land was impossible, but an invention that imagined travel by water made everything possible. The country we now know as Canada is quite otherwise inaccessible other than by water. So you look in the background and there's nothing but a wall of uh, trees. Because if you didn't have the canoes, your access through forested areas is really limited. Kevin likes to use his time off from the museum to go for a paddle in the birch bark canoe he built two years ago. But all the laughs we had making this canoe, uh, it stays in the canoe. You know, it's a nice connection to my ancestors. Uh, there's a real connection to, uh, to the past when you're making and paddling a, a birch bark canoe like this. There's nothing quite like sort of being able to center yourself. And the canoe is sort of a, a First Nation gift to Europeans and to the world. I mean, they're part of First Nation uh, technology and ingenuity, I think. It's a land of obstacle. I don't think the canoe was an accident in this country. It was, it was an essential part of travel on this continent. I'm Jeremy Ward. I'm the curator here at the Canadian Canoe Museum in Peterborough, Ontario. The Canadian Canoe Museum cares for the largest collection of canoes and paddled watercraft in the world. We have about 500 in storage. The bulk of our collection do come from Canada, uh, and this, of course, is, a, is the home of the canoe. The key that would unlock the, the landscape, these waterways are in your way, but if you have a portable vehicle, ride both the waters and be carried on your shoulders, uh, then, of course, now the, the world is your oyster. Jeremy is also a builder. He helped build the mother of all canoes, the famous Cano de Maitre. One real highlight for me was a few years ago to build a 36-foot Cano de Maitre, a 36-foot Montreal canoe, traditionally built birch bark canoe designed to carry four ton on the water. These are a, a giant of their, of their style. It, it was a design that was neither improved upon nor replaced by a European technology. The birch bark canoe is, to my mind, a perfection in design. It's where art, engineering, and science intersect. Randy Herman is the director of the Engineering Access Program at the University of Manitoba. First of all, you have the basic design, but every group of Aboriginal people would taper the canoe to fit their own set of circumstances. We have canoes that are made for, for fast flowing rivers. We have canoes that are made for oceans. We have canoes that are made for lakes. We have canoes for hunting out of, we have canoes for transporting. All of them follow the same basic form. However, their functions change and they, they tinker with that form to come up with the best craft for their needs. Not only could they transport a huge amount of weight, eventually when you ran out of a river and you had to portage, it was so easy to remove the, the, the goods, the luggage from the canoe, and then you could just carry the canoe. Originally, when the Europeans first came over uh, and started looking at the canoe, it was revolutionary to them because it was actually a forward-facing craft. You actually faced the way you were going. 
And in England at that time, most of the crafts were like rowboats where you would actually be back to where you were going. And they, it was okay because they didn't have a lot of fast moving rivers. But here it's, it's almost imperative that you face forward, otherwise you're going to hit a rock or you're going to go over rapids. Uh, and even more importantly, the facing forward was very important if you were trying to sneak up on a moose or a deer. So right now though we have a hydraulic jump kind of progressing up the flume. My name is Carly Delavo. I'm a PhD candidate through the Department of Civil Engineering here at the University of Manitoba, and I'm specializing in water resources engineering. Carly is a graduate of the Engineering Access Program at the University of Manitoba. NGAP is designed to help Native and Métis students pursue a career in engineering. So this experiment right now is going to touch upon uh, the drag forces that act on both the birch bark canoe as well as the barge type vessel. And right now the birch bark canoe is a lot lighter than the barge, so we need to add some weight to even up the weight between the two vessels, so that means it's a fair comparison when we assess how much drag is happening on both vessels. So with the birch bark canoe, we can see that we don't need to add any weight to this bucket here, so essentially the amount of drag that's occurring on the canoe is just the weight of the bucket. Um, so that essentially means that the streamlines, as they hit the front of the canoe, since the surface area of the bow is so small, they, they don't cause a lot of turbulence, they basically go right around, and that means there's not a lot of drag happening with this design. So that reflects in a more maneuverable, uh, faster moving vessel than what we'll see with the barge next. Okay, so now we've constructed a, a barge type vessel. So it's essentially the same dimensions as the birch bark canoe, but just a rectangular shape. So I have a cylinder of water here, it's a, a liter full, so I'm just going to start pulling some volume into this bucket and then we'll get an estimate of how the force of the drag on the uh, barge canoe. So I poured about 600 milliliters in there and we can see that equilibrium is happening. So this just tells us that we've had to pour quite a large amount of weight into this bucket to be able to compensate for the drag force that's happening on the barge craft. And we can even see if we look at the front of the craft, there's a lot of turbulence happening. The streamlines are not going around the craft as easily, so they're causing what are called turbulent eddies to occur um, along the sides. And this results in a much less maneuverable, less efficient design. Well, now we're going to test the buoyancy and stability of uh, both the birch bark canoe and the barge. So we're going to begin by adding some sandbags, which are about 10 pounds each, to look at how much weight they can hold and how the stability changes with weight. So we would expect, given that the birch bark canoe is about a third of the weight of the barge canoe, it might not be able to carry as much weight. And we'll add one more to go to 95. Let's take a look at what happens when we add a wave or two through the flume and look at the stability of the vessel then. So as we added all this weight to the, to the birch bark canoe, you could definitely see that the stability of the canoe now is much more stable than when it was empty. You can see it's even cutting through the water when to go to the front of the, of the wave flumes. So now we've got the barge canoe and we're going to load the barge canoe and take a look at how much weight it can handle and how stable it becomes. So that'll put us at 95. So this is the same amount of weight that we put in the birch bark canoe. So we can definitely see that although it does hold more weight when it comes to um, secondary stability with wave action, so not just calm water on a lake, we can see that the barge does not do very well with these waves. Hands down, I'd rather cross Canada with a canoe. I think it's beautiful, you know, there's, there's something about that streamlined shape and it's made of natural materials, this, the birch bark itself is from a beautiful tree. It's, a, it's both a work of art as well as a, a very efficient scientific design. People ask me, where'd you get this canoe? And I say, well, I found it in the bush. It's on December required. <laughs> Métis elder Marcel Labelle has made dozens of canoes for his life as a trapper hunter. I went to school and I learned how to read in books. But before that, I learned how to read the forest. Here 
In his backyard in Arthur, Ontario, he's patching one of his favorites with a combination of spruce gum, bear fat, and cedar ash. Seam is 100%. He believes that the canoe is an inspired design, elegant but incredibly sturdy, an Aboriginal gift to the world. 500 years ago, 600 years ago, this is the vehicle, the gift that our ancestors shared. What we did back then was not so primitive. It was a good design, it was a strong design. So I invite people to kick it, to slap it, to try and break it. You know, this is what we used to develop Canada. Think about it, that was a tractor trailer of the time, right? So I build them very strong. <laughs> It was the perfect design for the environment, entirely built from materials readily found everywhere. Putting all of these, these pieces of, that you gather from the bush together into something that sort of is an incredibly serviceable, durable watercraft just from the, the raw materials that can be collected uh, from virtually anywhere in North America. And so it's just a, a really remarkable feat in, of engineering. It didn't take long for European explorers and settlers to realize that the canoe was a technically superior device. 1668, the Nonsuch arrived into you know, Canada's north uh, and from there basically became abandoned at the, at the coast for any sort of access on the inside. And so it didn't take them long to realize that the European technology was far inferior and the First Nation technology was superior uh, with the birch bark canoe. Champlain early on, uh, is struggling with the rapids and the boats that he had and uh, watches the local First Nations people just breezing right by, picking up their canoe. And uh, he looks at them with marvel and says, you know, that's really a better way to get around on this landscape. Adopting the canoe meant that Europeans could now go anywhere the natives could. The only reason why the fur trade was so successful so quickly was because they were basically taking and merging on European trade goods onto an existing, very rich, very structured uh, trade network uh, and sort of connections across North America. Fire one! Here in Thunder Bay, the Fort William Historical Park is dedicated to recreating the moment when the fur trade and the birch bark canoe was at its ascendancy. I would like to propose a toast to our wintering partners and clerks, the lords of the lakes and forests. The year is 1815. Two companies, the Northwest and the Hudson Bay Company, were locked in a battle for furs, each employing thousands of natives, Métis, Canadians and Europeans. Fort William was the largest fur trading post in the world, famous as the hinge of the trade. Huge Canot de Maitre, Montreal canoes, carrying four tons and eight to 12 men, brought trade goods from the east. While slightly smaller Canot de Nord, with four to six men carrying one and a half tons, brought furs from the north. As many as 180 Canot de Nord a season for the Northwest Company alone. This was an industry totally dependent on the natives, for the furs, and most importantly, for the canoes. Today, Dave Brown, the fort's master canoe builder, is starting a new canoe. Before building anything, Dave has to gather materials. That means a shopping trip in the woods around the fort. You always have to go all the way around the tree before you start picking. Either flint for obsidian knife um, would have been used by the natives to peel the tree. Yeah, pull it off your way. In seconds, the skin of a new canoe is harvested. Next, Dave and his crew dig for spruce roots to sew the canoe together. The natives called them uh, golden root. So over here, it's going under a root. So on a small root like this, when they're fresh, you can just grab them with your fingernails and you do that. Right, and there's the root. So the gum coming out uh, can be picked off the tree. So what you would have to do with this then is purify it. Then we'll he grabs a little gum before it. heading back to the fort to build a canoe the way they have for centuries. We'll go um, so that it overlaps. The design and techniques that Dave is using 
have been passed down from generation to generation of native builders. They looked at their own body and figured our creator gave us the blueprint right here. So for the skin, they talked to the birch tree and they asked the birch tree if it was okay to borrow the skin. So it's just gonna go down on top of the bark. Yeah. This ancient design is unique just to boat the building. The canoe is made from the outside in. See how it's starting to come in? That's just from the hot water. So if we put really hot water here, this would bend over and actually lock itself onto that bottom gunnel uh, frame and you wouldn't, be able to, you wouldn't be able to straighten it out. Then the next layer, is your muscle. You don't need too many tools. All you need is patience and listen to the wood and just pulsate it. These are your ribs, just like your body. The canoe has the ribs. In the canoe, it's like the ribs in our body. It keeps the muscles from imploding, it keeps your gut from exploding. So it keeps the canoe from imploding or exploding. Dave uses one of the European innovations to bend the ribs, a steam box. The, the steam box would have been the European method. Um, natives probably were using more green wood. But once the rib is hot, we should be able to bend it to the right shape. Been in there about 20 minutes, but because it's hand split, it follows the grain more closely, so it bends better. Put it, and we're just gonna put it in till it's snug. The torts act as your sternum. Gunnels, the long pieces, you can imagine a backbone. If you look at your wrist, you look at the tendons in here. We borrowed roots from the spruce tree. When you make a hole in your skin, the blood coagulates and it heals. Same thing with the canoe. So we use the blood of the spruce tree to seal our canoe. So this is the blueprint. We carry it with us. You know, you hear our people say, ah, oh, the birch bark canoe, that's us. That's who we are. It's real. It really is us. The Aboriginal people uh, pre-colonization, their outlook on life was way more holistic than the Western civilization that came after them. The, the man who built the canoe, he was an artist, he was an engineer, and he was a scientist. He was all of those things. The canoe is a symbol of art, science, and engineering all mixing together in to, to form one beautiful, beautiful structure. The canoe, a First Nations gift from the past. A gift that made the present possible. An ancient design that provides a blueprint for the future. And as long as there are forests and water, and people who imagine and create an idea that will last forever.